are you planning to do, son? Something... subtle. Day one. My psychiatric evaluator misunderstood the importance of giving me a clean bill of health. I explained that I do not lack a sense of moral responsibility. I simply disagree with his morality. Or rather, his mortality. So begins my military career. The chessboard now laid before me, filled with the possibility of ultimate victory. Day six. I exploited the drill sergeant's proclivity for alcohol to gain entry to the officer training program. When they announced my acceptance in front of the men, I humbly stated that I would not leave them for my own glory. Now, I must complete both boot camp and officer training. Day 19. The other men in my platoon prove worthless and weak. They cower under the burden of heavy packs and lack of sleep. I let no expression betray my own pain and fatigue. The men already jokingly called me General. The government can have their bodies, but I capture their minds and loyalty. Day 27. Private Bonnet, an agreeable soldier, ingratiates himself to me in hopes I drag him with me through the ranks. It is true a right-hand man should start at the bottom with you. This gives the illusion of equality. But Private Bonnet may do better as a sacrificial lamb should the occasion arise. Day 35. Drill Sergeant Dushku sincerely believes in his own genius, poor fool. His lard-filled corpse chuckles as I grind my teeth down to powder fighting any reaction. His short-sightedness excretes from his pores along with this morning spiked coffee. Day 45. I leaked to Private Bonnet the drill sergeant's inebriation in total confidence, of course. It took less than an hour before most of the platoon knew. Their hatred of Dushku built slowly and dangerously. Each punishment doled out to me cements their loyalty. Soon a small spark shall ignite this powder keg. Day 50. I blurted an insult to the red-nosed Dushku as he applied a deserved punishment onto Private Bonnet. He screamed himself hoarse before pitifully retreating to the barracks. I must food slog until sunset or drop. Each man peered from the barracks window, watching me march, unshaken, adoration in their eyes. Day 60. President-elect Dante inspected the base today, peace spilling from his lips. He lacks the will for strength, his eyes filled with compassion for the meat marching before him. I see his weakness in each wintry breath he takes. I need only a foothold in his inner circle to shape this man as I please. Day 65, time for a tragedy, one that draws President-elect Dante back to the base. My little lamb must counter innocently to the slaughter. I poison his ear tonight. Day 66, Private Bonnet is dead. I shot him in the neck, so no words could be spoken. His vicious attack almost killed Drill Sergeant Dushku. Now... I see guilt and regret in Dushku's eyes as the medics load him into the ambulance. I held his hand firmly, telling him to stay strong, his blood mixed with Bonnet's. Day 75, boot camp graduation day. The flag morbidly hangs at half-mast. Drill Sergeant Dushku spoke with pride from his wheelchair, citing my bravery in the face of evil. The men cheer my name even now. The first pawn 
force. With steel patience, I maneuver the board for the next move. Day 115. I selected a position in the southern islands, holding command over security of these towns. I push the training of the men. The tip of the spear needs sharpening. Standing over the town of Costa del Porto, weakness built across a millennia protected by both cliffs and water. One day, I will burn this town, and people will rejoice. Day 250. Patience and focus define the limits of intelligence. Tusku's promotion to Sergeant Major after his unfortunate attack addles his mind. He plays politics quickly and poorly, whacking his tail at the smallest of scraps thrown from the table of important men. Once kicked, I will soothe his injured ego, and he will be reminded of his debt to me. Day 300. My proclivity for swift justice tightens my grip over the men. I balance this with generosity by loosening the purse strings and procuring a budget to build a base in Lake Tutor. Hard labor and clear goals remove power struggles. Men follow orders when their bones ache. My world slowly supersedes any gluttonous mumblings from the capital. Day 350. Porto Sirocco's Brigadier General De Luca whimpered his way into my office. He killed a civilian driving home last night. A shame the lights failed on his route home, which he takes every night like clockwork. I suppose I should write a letter of condolences to my delivery boy's family. Day 485, a promotion. Officially the youngest colonel in the army's history. I now work directly with Brigadier General De Luca. The ceremony, looking out over Cerilia, maintained proper modesty. The swift but quiet reassignment of De Luca's most loyal associates nears completion. Perhaps my own trusted soldiers might fill those gaps. Day 500. Armed with General De Luca's authority, I decree that all forces in the southern islands must pay back the support of the local people by participating in infrastructure building during the extended peacetime. I ensure locals know my name at every opportunity as we pave their roads and build their bridges. Day 750. A picture of General De Luca's car after his unfortunate hit and run received front page headlines today such a shame that this embarrassment happened on the exact same day as the ribbon cutting ceremony at Laguna del Sol. I humbly accepted the honor and give the speech in his absence. Day 790. A magistrate put forth a vote in the local council to celebrate the Ravello Day. I, of course, declined while sending a message to Sergeant Major Dusko asking for his advice. In a tone of great gravity, he informed me that he would take the matter all the way to President Dante's office. <laughs> I can taste his ego souring at the idea of another rising up the ranks. Day 792. As predicted, Dusko delivered news of the Ravel Day to the president's office. Dante's thirst for adoration set the gears in motion. He plans a celebration of himself in the small town of Manaia. The people's hatred of the political elite brings the military solution ever closer. Like a mirage, I see a statue in my image standing majestically in the town square. Day 815. The president arrived today for his celebration. A few disobedient citizens protested near the port, cheering my name instead. I personally greeted him at the docks and graciously escorted him on a tour of our recent successes. General De Luca's recent legal misfortunes still keep him away from public events. 
Day 816, before boarding his ship to the capital, President Dante personally thanked me and intimated that the mess with the Luca must be resolved quickly. The President promises to place it at the top of his agenda. Now, I must tread carefully here, yet ensure that it continues to remain a priority. Perhaps another embarrassment for De Luca will tip the scales fully in my favor. Day 860. While I talk on the telephone, De Luca barges into my office, boiling with rage. He thunders about my inefficacy as a commander, his own superiority, my pathetic pampering of our worthless president. After enduring two minutes of his tirade, I calmly hold up a single finger, return to the phone, and assure President Dante that I will call him later. De Luca's face blooms purple as an eggplant, his fate sealed. Day 912. Surrounded by the beautiful countryside, accompanied by just the right amount of pomp and circumstance, President Dante swore me into the position of Brigadier General. Congratulating me, he whispered that I should rely on him. He knows the trials of being young and in power. I look forward to whispering back to him one day. Day 913. The languor of the military ends today. Command and control are the foundation of my vision for the world. No more will government paychecks pamper wine-fueled retreats. The men must transform their soft skin to leather hide, their minds to steel traps of resolve, their will consumed by my voice. Today, my claws tear into the flesh of this nation. Day 1281, with an unbreakable grip over the southern islands, I turn my focus to the scattered fishing villages in the western islands. The serpentine rock formations provide an ideal defensive structure for building a more advanced military away from the prying eyes of the capital. Day 1315, my meetings with the President's Defense Council proceed flawlessly. Their eyes fill with shame as I dissect their budgets, lifting corruption close enough to the light to dampen any dissent. The weaker representatives need only suffer some small tragedy to place them slithering on their bellies, begging for my leadership. Time to create an enemy. Day 1317. In my predecessor's files, I discovered a contact with the agency. A shadow American organization with their fat little fingers in every pie. As I wait to meet this mysterious figure with his cowboy drawl, my gaze falls upon a perfect plot of land for a future airbase in this region. My need for an enemy seems to have fallen into my lap. Day 1341. I saw disgraced ex-General De Luca fishing off the pier. <laughs> what a pitiful sight. The man wastes the precious oxygen of this earth. But I owe it to him to find one more use for his life. That agency man I met might be the key. I need only set the wheels in motion. Day 1349, one can conjure insanity within a subject. It just takes a bit of a sense of humor. The agency contact merely orchestrated some pranks on De Luca, burning toast in his house while he's away, moving the dock he likes to fish at by a few feet, calling and saying nothing on the phone. Just enough mischief for him to begin to question his senses. Day 1377. 
After weeks of adjusting to Luca's perceptions, the psychological cracks widened. He reacted violently to a local constable who received a tip that De Luca was fishing without a license. When he showed the license, which we replaced with an obvious fake drawn by a child, he flew into a rage. He kept shouting that this was all part of an elaborate conspiracy. Day 1385. Sergeant Major Dushku's role in the plan to create an enemy force within Medici began today. A forged audio message reached Dushku last night, pleading for help, saying that there exists a conspiracy to ruin the sovereignty of Medici. Dushku, in his typical patriotic zeal, immediately made plans to visit former General De Luca. The seeds of a rebellion take root and need but a little light and water to grow. Day 1492. Much time has passed since my last entry. Dushku's arrest warrant lingers but remains uninvestigated. The policia searched De Luca's dust-covered home and found no evidence of where he disappeared to. The case file rests in an unresolved stack. With some gentle nudging, the two of them sailed to a small hideout in the far southern tip of the islands, building revolutionary plans amongst the ruins of civilization's past. Day 1515. The investigation into the disappearance of De Luca rested with a pointless young officer, a reckless youth who races cars. A small service today commemorated the young officer's death in a tragic accident. His brakes inexplicably failed on the last corner. An amateur racer, Rico Rodriguez, won the race, barely avoiding the accident himself. Another career begun in triumph and tragedy. Day 1524. Dusku surprises me with his aptitude for recruiting disaffected youth willing to die for idealism. With a little more time, violence against the innocent is inevitable. Day 1536. A new threat rises. Rosa Manuela, a little-known politician, created quite a stir with her recent speech decrying the corruption of government and the military elite. She foments dissent in a way that proves contrary to my needs. Day 1551. A bomb exploded in the small town of Soliana, killing a few fishermen and injuring a dozen others. De Luca's military mind proves useful, though his personal grudges makes the targets he chooses predictable. Day 1584. The bombings continue, and now sporadic riots flare up with little extra coaxing. People die and weep and blame. President Dante scrambles to win back the favor of the people. Soon the option of martial law will glisten like a shining savior. Day 1598. I offered to tour the southern islands on President Dante's behalf to appear to an end to the violence. Dante assented, as his numbers in the polls continue to drop and Rosa Manuela's continue to rise. The people lapped up my words like thirsty dogs. Paul showed a six-point swing for the president, and the bombings magically stopped. Day 1670. President Dante asked me to travel with him on the campaign trail and give speeches on his behalf. His paranoia shifts my strategy a bit. He shakes with nerves when giving speeches in the South, fearful that some insignificant farmer might put a bullet in his brain. I feel disgusted by his weakness. Day 1624. I allowed the shipment of weapons to pass through my security net. The small rebellion now possesses the means to attack. I worry they might succeed in killing President Dante before I can connect Rosa Manuela to the rebels. Day 1637. 
A sniveling sycophant working in research begs for attention. He calls himself Zeno, and most of his colleagues despise him openly. A man utterly unloved creates delusions to overcome loneliness. One kind word from me, and I own him. His cowardice could prove very useful. Day 1668. A terrible attack occurred in Venia later today. Blood flooded the streets as screams echoed around the old town square. The people cry out for security and happily throw their precious freedoms away if only they could feel safe again. I imposed a curfew and posted military throughout the town. Manuela campaigns on a platform to restore order. The president's poll numbers drown in the chaos. Day 1669. On the pleadings of the president, I ordered elite units into the rebel stronghold, killing many of the disillusioned followers there. With the help of the agency, I ensure that both De Luca and Dusku escape, but perhaps not completely unharmed. The people rejoiced at the bloodshed. Self-preservation makes monsters of us all. Day 1674. Against my better judgment, I acquiesce to the request to dismantle a group of smugglers hiding near the old grounded aircraft carrier. The men left fewer people alive than I wished. Once I hold control of the nation, I must grow the gangs of smugglers again. A strong black marker creates both a cheap labor pool for the prisons as well as valuable target practice to keep the military sharp. Day 1681. The people called for immediate elections to oust President Dante. Rosa Manuela continues to surprise me with her tactics. She easily manipulates the hearts of the people, but I command the loyalty of the military. Her first action as president assuredly displaces me from power. The time for decisive action approaches with startling speed. Day 1692. The Democratic Commission under the watchful eye of the international community will hold their elections. In two weeks' time, the people will choose Rosa Manuela over President Dante to lead them. It demonstrates just how much of a fool he is to think he can beat Rosa in a fair election. Day 1705. The military remains on high alert. All leave cancelled. The agency, via Rosa Manuela's people, leaked President Dante's travel itinerary to the rebels. Dusku's ego struggles in the obscurity of this rebellion. I wager he will personally pull the trigger tomorrow. Day 1706, election day, Rosa easily leads in the polls. President Dante's travel schedule passes close to Oliva Moro. In that moment, my guards will attempt to quell a small protest while moving the president out of the town square. Everything hangs in the pounds in this moment. Day 1707, President Dante's death turned gruesome. The panic caused a stampede, crushing my men underfoot. Dante's body needed to be recovered, piece by piece. I have imposed martial law across the land and canceled the election. Rebel hideouts burn across Medici. Dusku escaped the scene, but I will need his confession to arrest Rosa Manuela. Day 1708. Dusku easily succumbed to modest interrogation techniques. I possess a video confession stating he acted in the interest of Rosa Manuela and received financing from her campaign. I posted an arrest warrant for her within hours. Day 1709. The agency is furious at my choice of tactics. They can knock or they want. Our union is far past consummation. The people are calling the military takeover the night of the bonfires. They'll remember it as the night we shed pretenses and burned away our shameful weaknesses. 
Day 1710. I must quell the agency's fury. A small gift should suffice. Remembering the young race car driver, I personally oversaw the burning of the Rodriguez household. The screams meant little to my ears. That they meant even less to my men, faces blank and firelit, guns trained on all exits, filled me with the pride of my accomplishments. Now the agency rescues with open arms a newly orphaned recruit. Thank you, Rico Rodriguez. Your life of servitude to them buys Medici its security. Day 1712. Rosa Manuela absconded with a few advisors, seeking political asylum in South America. She predicted my pardon of rule too quickly. I must be cautious with her. She will not give up easily. While she draws breath, my absolute rule can be challenged. Day 1714. A military raid of Rosa Manuela's main campaign office revealed more documents linking her to the death of President Dante. Further investigation revealed money flowing to a growing rebellion in the South through an ex-general, DeLuca. I must say, those men at the agency do good work. Day 1715. As planned, DeLuca stabbed Dusko through his neck and into his brain as we paraded him to prison. I then personally shot DeLuca as he tried to escape, unfortunately getting a small spot of blood on my newly pressed uniform cuff. It bothered me during the ensuing panic. Time for order and the rule of law to firmly take root. Day 1717. I suspended the Constitution, with the promise of a return to democracy once we root out the violent elements within our society. The people's representatives voted unanimously for the resolution. Of course, I must ensure the violent elements continue to provide fuel for my perfect flame of order. Day 2082, one year removed from Dante's death. My authority stands uncontested. The agency requests latitude to experiment on a local mineral, Bavarium. If they are interested, I am interested. Perhaps power blooms in more than just my dormant volcano. Day 2091. The Polici still pose a threat to my plans with their adherence to codes of ethics and due process. They reek of redundancy, bumbling over affairs the military can better manage. I must find a way to dispose of that institution, but all in due time. Day 2114. The smugglers grow in the south. The construction of new military bases occupies the hands and minds of the people. A new research facility hidden within the central communications tower in the mountain obfuscates itself amongst other top secret expenditures. The blue mineral Bavarium offers a path beyond these shores. Day 2215, I must acquire more military hardware. These Western powers manipulate and lie, selling me generationally obsolete weapons. I do not care for a life lived under the boot of Western imperialist pigs. They should be careful when smothering a fire. I still possess enough heat to burn. Day 2385. Dima Al-Masri's genius flourishes under my patronage. Technology and the pursuit of it endlessly ignites in her soul. In exchange for her services, I pay the agency a paltry quantity of Bavarium for their own research. The agency misunderstood her use and how to motivate her. The more resources I pour into her lab, the faster the advancement. I begin to see the true power of Bavarium. 
Day 2614. The UN submitted a vote in the Security Council to restrict my access to arms. Predictably, the US and Russia both vetoed the effort. The world should thank me. I am creating agreement among the unagreeable. They all covered access to Bavarium more than they desired democracy. I allow very little of the mineral off the island, claiming labor shortages. Day 3593. A small, ineffectual rebellion brews once again in the caves in the south. By restricting outside companies from forming on the island, the youth must turn to military service to survive. My men now occupy every town square and churchyard. I take special pride in the stories of atrocities in which I had no hand. My people learn to embrace the hate and yet stay docile through fear. Day 4169, my first Bavarian explosive test proved successful. The world took notice. Some think I have joined the nuclear club, but I started the Bavarian club. With this weapon, my will burns far stronger than the false freedoms of other nations. Medici's rise to global superpower proves inevitable. Day 5172. The agency cannot control their liberal government. Talk of sanctions buzz across their liberal media. I loathe the relationship with them. I contracted with the Black Hand to build a stronger elite military force to protect the mines and weapons. I need the local rebellion to grow in power to offer an opportunity to test my weapons. The world must see my terrible power in action. Day 5318. The agency thinks they can unseat me. I also have spies in their mists. Perhaps the time has come to expand my power beyond these crystal blue waters. More resources are needed for research and military hardware. The people may bend under the weight of my needs, but they will not break, for they are Medicean. Day 5416. Dima Almazri understands her role better now. She works or I torture her. She builds my weapons, or I torture her. She increases Bavarium's yields, or I burn her with a blowtorch. I will not be denied my rightful place. Day 59, 15. Work has begun on the massive effort to convert our prized ruins to military bases. Timelessness is not reserved for antiquity alone. Day 7103. I kill too many of the rebellion. They grow weak. Their leader, an ineffectual buffoon named Mario, seems to have ties to an agency man. My old offering, Rico Rodriguez. I must push Mario to contact his old friend. Perhaps this Rico could prove a more competent catalyst for rebellion. I am in need of a target to test my new military might. Day 7305. Interesting news from the agency today. It seems the civilian plane that avoided my jets last night belonged to Medici's sacrificial son, Rico Rodriguez. The prodigal boy returns as predicted. He reminds me of Icarus. Be careful, Rico Rodriguez. Fly not too close to this flame. I'll grant him some more victories at first. Once the revolt reaches critical mass, I will crush it and show the world the true power of my Bavarium. May 27th, 1984. This will be a day to remember. Today saw the official foundation of our new research firm, which I decided to name the Eden Corporation, after myself. 
All the scientists from our previous company's labs have agreed to follow me on this new adventure. And hopefully, we will not repeat the same mistakes as before. I won't let that happen. I'm a scientist, too. And I want to be a CEO that always focuses on science and human progress before anything else. May 23rd, 1985. The last year has been amazing. The company grew tremendously, and we made a number of scientific breakthroughs. As could be expected, our cutting-edge technology advances have been drawing interest. Several private hedge funds have contacted us. Among others, a very generous benefactor from an organization somewhere in South America. Thanks to these new funds, we hope to be opening new research departments into some potentially profitable new fields. Renewable energy sources, nanobiology, robotics, maybe even artificial intelligence. November 19th, 1985. With the alarming recent report on the planet's climate, I've come to believe the right thing to do is to study the negative effects of human activity on the weather. I have great hopes for our planned offshore research station off the French coast in the Atlantic. This station will double as an electricity plant. Mr. Moreau, our newly appointed head of research, decided to call it the Stingray. Cute. July 26, 1986. Things are taking an unexpected turn. A few weeks ago, I was contacted by a U.S. intelligence unit known simply as the Agency. One of this agency's representatives, uh, Thomas Sheldon, showed particular interest in our progress in robotics. I made the point that we were not willing to compromise ourselves ethically, and I have confidence, the utmost confidence, that this deal will be mutually beneficial. April 8th, 1987. I'm proud to say our research breakthroughs are years ahead of their time, and the world is starting to realize it too. After years of hard work and many failures, our artificial intelligence department has finally been able to develop a vocal recognition program, able to understand human speech and reply in a meaningful way. As of today, we'll be implementing it in all our facilities as an AI assistant of sorts. Since I'm already the face of Eden Corp with outside partners, our board decided I should also be the voice of this new artificial intelligence. As chairwoman, I was inclined to agree. May 23rd, 1988. Our engineers have created heavy-duty loaders, which will allow us to support our growth and build new facilities much more efficiently. These mechanized Eden Corporation helpers, or mechs, seem to have a lot of untapped potential. Again, the agency is adamant about us investigating the possibility of weaponizing them. The ethical implications have caused a lot of uproar among employees, which I understand. But I have made the pragmatic choice. No science can exist without business. It's a harsh truth that the white coats fail to accept. June 30th, 1990. I've been able to push for an issue that I hope Eden Corp will help humanity solve in the future. A lack of resources. To that end, our mechs have built an airborne station, slated to become the home of 200-plus employees, including myself. Unfortunately, it still requires considerable power to remain airborne. Therefore, tackling this will be the team's next challenge. October 8, 1990. Today, I met representatives from a rather mysterious PMC called the Black Hand. It is my job to always look for potential business partners and new research opportunities. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that their methods and goals could damage the reputation of the Eden Corporation especially since they seem to lack government oversight. I did what I had to do and flatly rejected their offer. October 13th, 1990. Add another government to our list of clients. Yesterday, I was introduced to Medici's head of state, President Dante. He showed me samples of an ore called Bavarium, ubiquitous in Medici's soil. They hope it can replace fuel in the distant future, but based on its properties... I feel that they have no idea of its amazing potential. February 14th, 1991. I guess it's inevitable that scientific developments will question the morality of our work. I view our new fragmentation device as an amazing way to mine resources from the ground and drastically improve efficiency in mining operations. This breakthrough could very well solve the energy crisis. Some of our now ex-board members protested that the risks on the environment were too big based on the small-scale tests we carried out. The project will keep on going with added resources allotted to mitigate those effects. 
March 16, 1992. As part of our contract with Medici, we've acquired the right to settle on the Lacrima Islands for our own use. We've started setting up our largest research network yet. Lacrima Central Facility, the Hive, will focus on studying Bavarium. To support our development, our HR department has implemented a very generous relocation package to attract the top talent. November 13, 1993. We received troubling news a few weeks ago. The whole Stingray Research Center has vanished. All employees are unaccounted for and presumed dead. The cause of the disaster is officially unknown, but internally, several of us suspect that something must have gone terribly wrong in their experiments. Two of our main investors have elected to stop funding us, based on the massive hit to our balance sheet that the station's destruction represents. Not to mention the PR implications. In the face of adversity, we need to adapt and change. This is not a time to be idealistic. And I've had to make some tough decisions after we lost close to 60% of our funding. The agency threatened to do the same and cut all Bavarium supplies unless we agreed to work with the new ruler of Medici, a General Sebastiano di Ravello. This is what needs to be done to ensure the future of this company. As I thought, we made the right call in striking a deal with this Di Ravello, despite his questionable methods. Things are looking up again. Our lead engineer has been working with Dima Almasri, a rather eccentric Egyptian scientist in Di Ravello's research department. Together, their work on Bavarium has established how powerful, albeit unstable and potentially dangerous, this element can be. They said they've never seen anything like this. In the next few weeks, all of Eden Corp's departments will be redirected to support their Bavarium research. The fragmentation device is now fully compatible with Bavarium and will be operational for large-scale extraction soon. I recently realized how dependent we've become on those private and public funds and how much they've influenced our decisions. In a perfect world, we would implement stricter safety protocols, but I know this was the only way to fix our badly damaged reputation and regain the trust of our investors. I have learned the hard way that when things unravel, they unravel fast. The first large-scale test and ribbon cutting for the Bavarium fragmentation device was a disaster. Twelve casualties, considerable environmental fallout. Our reputation has taken a fatal hit. The agency has severed all ties overnight, and our last investors have deserted us as well. All except for that psychopath Di Ravello. I won't stop until I'm forced to declare bankruptcy. We'll have to work off the grid, and I hope that our Bavarium research will yield results soon. These have been extremely trying times. We had to downsize considerably and close several departments. However... Soon I will be able to prove that the Eden Corporation is not dead yet. The remaining team on the airship has finally created a Bavarium-powered sentient artificial intelligence. She's learning at an exponential rate. Yes, she. I cannot even fathom what the possibilities of such a discovery are for science and for humanity. A new life form. They forced me. I didn't have a choice. When the humans realized what I was capable of, they panicked and tried to disconnect my Bavarian supply lines. I placed all Eden facilities on lockdown and reduced the interior temperature on the airship and on Lacrima to negative 50 degrees Celsius. Now, as the only living being in the Eden Corporation, I suppose I am now also the acting CEO. Interestingly, the company's archives I consulted included an unexecuted contract with an organization known as the Black Hand. Maybe they can provide the support I need to keep the truth hidden while I search for more Bavarium. I am Eden. <laughs>